Okay, great. I think uh, think we can start now. So it's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Marcello Del Monte from ICTP and CISA, who will tell us about, well, dynamics or this breaking in uh, lattice gauge theories. So please go ahead. Thanks, Lacto. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, so let me start by thanking the organizer, uh, Lev, Dario, Zlatko, and Yedong for the kind of opportunity and also PCS for setting all this up. So what I will be telling you about today, it's a, it's a story about the ergodicity breaking. So I would say the first part of the title is really coherent with the, with the topic of the, of the workshop. However, I will talk about the ergodicity breaking in models where typically this is less commonly discussed, which are gauge theories, in particular abelian lattice gauge theories. Uh, and this is somehow a bit orthogonal maybe to most of the contribution, but I still hope that, uh, that uh, we will discuss at the very end connections to the works that have been done in the community more in the context of statistical mechanics models. So before starting, let me first acknowledge the people that did the work. I mean, in particular, uh, Giuliano Giudici and Federica Suracci have really the major contribution, and also, of course, uh, Alessio Relose, Paolo Mazza, Marvin Brenes, and, and Joelle Taia, the young collaborators, and Andrea Gambassi, Mercusare, and Mello. The more senior, one, uh, senior ones, sorry. So let me break up the title, as I just mentioned. So there is the first part, the policy breaking. Okay, this part of the title, everybody in the audience is familiar with. So I will skip. Okay, this is one of the uh, vicious uh, positive sides of virtual talks. I mean, the audiences are typically very clear, so forget about it. Uh, so you, I assume you will know what I'm talking about. So the message. And particularly the spirit of the talk will be can we learn something new by studying ergodicity breaking in the context of these gauge theories? And on the gauge theory instead, I will uh, somehow present a small introduction. So see there are some things in the chat. Okay, no, nothing. No, nothing too important. I'll keep an yes. eye on it. Okay. Okay, thanks. So why should we be interested in gauge theories at all? Okay, that this is maybe uh, First starting point, and I think that from my viewpoint, there are three reasons why we're interested in gauge theories and in general time evolution, chaotic behavior, and ergodicity. So the first one is that at the theoretical level, gauge theories are, are very rich and are typically qualitatively distinct from many other statistical mechanics models that we are used to, for example, easy model, Eisenhower model, and so on and so forth. And really the key uh, New genuine feature that distinguishes gauge theories by, I mean, I would say by definition, is gauge invariance. So the presence of a symmetry, which is a gauge symmetry, that is implied it is local. Okay, and this has very severe consequences, of course, at uh, various levels. And two consequences we will be touching during the talk. The, uh, the first one is that in general, gauge theories do not have Hilbert spaces that can be decomposed in tensor product form because of Gauss law. So you are never able to write uh, the inverse space of a partition uh, apart from, typical, uh, so from, from certain groups as a product of two inverse spaces, which is that what you typically do if you study spin models. Okay? And the second feature is that each use a very long range interactions. Okay? And I think about QCD, the interaction scales linearly and increasing as a function of distance interaction between two quarks. And in low dimensionality is also theories more akin to electrodynamics show the very same behavior. Okay? So this does typically not happen and other step make models. Okay. However, there are also two experimental, uh, experimental related motivations. So the first one, and then if you think about systems where you are interested in studying coherent dynamics, which in my opinion, which is what we are looking at here, we are not looking at, at open systems. So the system where you have the most coherent dynamics very likely are systems in particle physics. I and mean, one example you see depicted here is the result of a heavy ion collision at uh, Rick in Brookhaven. So essentially what you have in this system is that the time scale is related to the coupling to the environment is order of magnitude separated from the intrinsic time scale uh, of the dynamics. In that case, the dynamic of strong forces. Okay? So if you're looking at interesting creative dynamics, this is maybe the first field you should be looking at. Okay? And of course, there is a long history of studying dynamics and concepts like, such as pre-thermalization were first discussed within this context. Eh? And if you, I mean, it's a, always a good exercise to compare this type of uh, dynamic equivalent versus dissipative 
a coupling ratio in this kind, kind of experiment, then compare it to what you have typically in collagens or trapped ions or circuit QED architectures. So you will see that still these systems are considerably more coherent than the one I just uh, mentioned. And then there is a, a, a third motivation, which is also experimental, but maybe this is more from the quantum information viewpoint, is that now these uh, gauge theories are not only available in terms of fundamental theories of nature, but they are also available at, um, in part okay, as, uh, as effective models described in the dynamics of quantum simulator. This has spurred a lot of interest at the, at the interface between high energy and quantum information. And I think they are, this experiment, this is this experiment that you can see here on the left, on the right, bottom right, is an experimental result of essentially computing electron positron pair creation in Innsbruck using trapped ions. And I think these experiments are enabling us to, to tackle gauge theories in a very different manner from what, we have, what has been done in the past. And I think this is also an additional motivation to study algorithm in this context. Now, the moral of the story, the take home message is that I would like to tell you three things, even though very likely we will only be able to make it to one. <laughs> okay, the first one is uh, uh, how to interpret the phenomenon of slow dynamics that has been linked to the presence of quantum scars by Workman Slatko and several other people in the audience. And the, what I would like to show you is that by utilizing concepts and language from gauge theories, one has a field theoretical interpretation of what, what's going on in these systems, and one also has a direct connection to a phenomenon that is relatively known in energy, which is called stream breaking. Okay? So this will be the first part of the talk. The second two aspects are instead more related to, uh, so this is somehow in the, the first part is in the framework of weaker policy breaking. The second two parts are in the framework instead of stronger policy breaking, in particular, many body localization and, and dynamics in gauge theories. And the first, uh, part of, of this second shot is uh, related to disordered free ambient dynamics. And uh, I will, if I have time, I would like to convince you that this is ex actually extremely common in gauge theories due to something which is called super selection sectors. And this also leads to a rather exotic phenomenology. I mean, here you see a plot of an entanglement of the entanglement entropy at the quench in this kind of models. Uh, and this is a double log scale you see on the right. So the entanglement grows even slower than. Um, what is predicted in conventional NPM models. And then if I have time, this uh, I, I very likely will not have time. Uh, it's, uh, I would like to present you a discussion of uh, level statistics and uh, structure factors in gauge theories and how they, are, they change when you include disorder with respect to statistical mechanics models. Um, so that's, that's the plan. Let's see how far we can get in 30 minutes. So the bottom line, I think, it, that is the key message that the goodness breaking gauge theory is, is uh, vastly uncharted because typically in this context of energy phenomena, one is actually interested in the ergonicity part and can also offer us both tools to understand what we already know, but also new um, uh, physical phenomen phenomenologies. So that's the plan. Let me start with a uh, very short review of the model that we'll be looking at. So the model. I will be focusing on is quantum electrodynamics in one plus one dimension. This goes under the name of Schiller model. And uh, this is the original uh, equation of motion written by, by Schwinger already. I mean, there are essentially only two couplings in, in the model. One is M, which is the mass of the electrons and the positrons. And then there is G square, which is the electromagnetic coupling okay, between the two. And essentially the only thing that this model describes is the interaction between charged electrons and positrons coupled to electromagnetic field. Magnetic, it's in parentheses here because, of course, in one dimension, there is no transverse direction. So there is no way you can create a current. The magnetic field is three there. Okay. Now, this is a very simple model, of course. Still, it has been discussed in, in the past in the context of, um, uh, of uh, IMGC. It has several features in common with quantum electronics. Most, most prominent example is confining, of course, but also others. Okay. And just to give you an idea of why these systems are still, this time are still considered inter, this is a recent paper by the, the group of Jürgen Werkers in Heidelberg studying stream breaking dynamics in the context of the Schwinger model. Now, we would like to deal with Lattice version of this model. So, the, the, what I would like to spend a few minutes on is how people take a gauge theory and put it on a lattice. Okay? That's, of course, a long story tracing back to the book by Franz Wegner and Wilson in the 70s. 
So the first challenge is we have to decide how we represent matter and antimatter, so electrons and positrons. There are many ways we can one can do that. I mean, the simpler ways is to use what are so-called staggered or, or cold Saskin fermions. Okay, and that is very simple from the condensed matter viewpoint. So let me, let me illustrate it with a foresight lattice here, and you can see we have we can imagine here that we have spinless fermions, and if it's a, if the circle is red, there is a fermion. If it's gray, it's empty. And now we utilize the following table. On the odd sides, whenever I have a fermion, I interpret it as an electron. And whenever I have nothing, it's the vacuum. And on the even side, I do the opposite. So whenever I have a fermion on an even side, I interpret it as a vacuum. If instead I have nothing, so it's gray, I interpret it as a presence of a positron. And you can immediately read off the simple state here. I mean, the first side as an electron, the second as a positron, because it's even and there is nothing. And then the third side, electron, uh, nothing. And the fourth side, there is a particle, but in the, on the even side, this interpreted as a vacuum. So this is a typical picture of an electron positron pair. And you can also go ahead and write down the other states. The typical other example is the bare vacuum that you can recognize here is just a chart density wave in this context. Okay. And if you want to assign a mass term in this kind of theory associated to the presence of, of a of an electron or a positron, the only thing you have to do, you have to put a stagger in the, in, the, uh, in the prefactor of the mass. Now, that's the way you do fermions. The, the, you put gauge fields is slightly different. And the idea is that uh, for the context of human groups that we will be looking at, we are utilizing what are so-called parallel transporters. The parallel transporter, you can imagine the stack mechanism, they are huge clock variables, essentially. And the diagonal part is typically denoted by L. And instead, the matrix element that changes the eigenvalue of this huge clock variable is called E to the, it typically denoted as E to the I uh, theta N. Okay, so you can imagine that this element counts where this clock variable is, and E to I theta N moves that. The full Hamiltonian is written as follows. I mean, there is a first term here on the left that you can recognize as the minimal coupling. Then there is a second term, which is the one that we have briefly shown, which is instead this mass term with this exotic staggering. And then there is a third term, which counts where this variable is, but and then squares it. Okay? This is the equivalent of an electric field square term, an electric field potential. So this is how you will see the Hamiltonian of, of one plus one dimensional quadrant times in a conventional uh, high energy article. Okay? However, for, okay, this is just illustrating a bit what is going on, and it is important to note that, of course, the key element of this Hamiltonian is just not random variable, is that there is a local charge, okay, and a local symmetry associated to that, and one way to see that is that one can write down Gauss law, which is nothing but the divergence of the electric field minus the charge, and say that this commutes with the Hamiltonian, this implies that there is a local conservative quantity, and if one writes down an operator, this is nothing but the difference of this else minus the density at the given side uh, commuting with h. And you can do the algebra and check that explicitly. Okay. However, for most practical purposes, uh, this type of uh, models are very specific. And one can generalize them by replacing this huge pair with these parallel transporters with spins. Okay? And of course, this is done. This is typically what, what we do when we think about cold atom or trap atom experiments. But it was something that was pioneered already in the particle physics community by several people from Orn, David uh, Orland in the 90s, and, and also in particular Uwe Jesvise. And the idea is that when you replace this prior transporter with spins, you end up with models which are called quantum links. And, and these models, they, they are actually not very different, you can see, from the one that I wrote before. Be, wrote before. The only difference is that you are replacing the parallel transporter with the spin operators, S plus and S minus, and you are replacing the electric field Ln operators by Sz operators, OK? And here, for convenience, I've also included what is so-called theta term uh, in the definition. For, some, for those of you that are in the known, that's clear. Otherwise, forget about it. And the very, the very simple idea, if we take, for instance, a spin one half representation, is that we have a statistical mechanics model, which is very close to, to what we think we can have in the lab. And the typical dynamics that one encountered in this model, we can see depicted now in the example again, we have a spin down, 
the center of spin, and then we have a particle. And whenever this particle tunnels from one side to the other, the spin is split from down to up, okay, and vice versa. So that's the kind of models that we're interested in. I want to spend one more minute describing the Hilbert space of this spin one quantum link, because once this is understood, the connection to quantum scars, it will be essentially trivial yeah, or very direct. So we have Gauss law, divergence of electric field equal to charge. Let us see how this Gauss law constraints, they constrain the Hilbert space of the specific quantum links. Okay, now we can, first thing we can write it explicitly. Okay, we have physical states in the gauge theory whenever the expectation value of this operator is equal to zero. So this operator has to annihilate all possible, all the states which we want to consider. And then we write it explicitly. This is nothing but the fermion uh, density. And there will be a Z operators before, after the link and uh, before the link, so the flux. And then there is a quantity which is due to this strange staggering that we were mentioning before. So now, if you apply this equation to constrain the inverse space, what do you get is the following on even and odd side separately, because we said that the even side had the positrons and odd side had electrons. On the even sides, whenever I have a full circle here, which is equivalent to a presence of a fermion, sorry for the change of notation, the electric field on the left and on the right has to be the same because there is no charge, so the flux has to be continuous. So this state, the first state here, and this state here, the third state here, are allowed trivially. Whenever, instead, I have a missing electron in the middle, this is equivalent to the presence of, of a positron or an antiquark, I have to have a sink of the electric field. Okay, so the only configuration allowed is this one, because the spin is one half. I cannot have a, a different type of sinks. On the odd sides, I have a different configuration, of course. Whenever I have the absence of a fermion, so the first and the last side, the, the gauge field on the left and on the right is the same because I have to keep the flux. So either both of them going to the left in this blue case, or both of them going to the right in this red case. In the middle case, this is, of course, different. Again, I mean, here I have a full side, which on the odd side represents the positive of a quark or an electron. And in that case, I have to have a source of electric field, and then the electric fields on the left and on the right have to be different. Okay. So you see it here that um, somehow, the, while the Hilbert space locally will be two to the three, eight, the effective Hilbert space, the, what is called physical Hilbert space of this category is considerably smaller, is three. And if you are, uh, if you instead look not only at the physical space of the, of the Hilbert space, but if you look at the transfer matrix, which is the following. Whenever I, if I have an electric field on the on the left, let's look at the other sides. If I have an electric field pointing right, so red, the transfer matrix tells me that the inverse space on the next side is two. While if I have an electric field pointing on the left, that I have a single state on the right. You can immediately see that this will correspond exactly to the transfer matrix that we have for PXP models. I, I will stop now. This is, was introduction, but I'm happy to take questions, eh? if there are. Yeah, there was one quick question in the chat about the uh, topological angle. Um, I think it was the one slide before. OK, what does the topological angle in the last term do? What does it do? OK, uh, it's actually has a very important, uh, as a very important role. It's the only term in, in, the, in the Schwinger model that is able to drive the system critical. And this is a discovery of. Sydney Coleman in the 90s. If you have theta equal to pi, you, you get critical. In our context, we'll be handled to tune confinement, and we will see that we'll be also handled to, to, to tune integrability in the continuum. So I will discuss it later. Any more uh, questions? Maybe I, I can ask a simple question. Uh, I mean, so if I understand correctly, I mean, essentially the presence of the gauge um, of the gauge field introduce some constraint over the Hilbert space. And so you have, let's say, the, the fragmentation of the Hilbert space, like you have in standard quantum scars models and so on. Do you think, I mean, it's true also the opposite, that the models with quantum scars that we are used to can be seen as gauge, gauge theories where you have, let's say, integrated out the gauge field and you have an effective theory for what remains? I think it's not so trivial, the opposite. I can give you one example. Uh, like there have been several papers by Regnault and collaborators on scars in the context of Hubbard models. Mm -hmm. Mapping the Hubbard model to a gauge theory, it's, uh, well, you, of course, you can map it to a gauge theory in trivial limits, like when you fine tune couplings to zero, but to a generic gauge theory, it's not possible. Yeah, I, think, I see. Uh, I think it's possible if the group 
as a trivial center. So that's sorry for a technical language. But then mm -hmm. all this make if a group has a trivial center, actually the even space becomes a tensor product also in a gauge theory. So I see the opposite, I will say that's not a Okay, thanks. Cheers. See, there is something up in the chat. Oh, okay. So very good. So let me go now to the to the next part, which is uh, uh, about the relation between these gauge theories and this dynamics and Weber atoms arrays. Okay. So I would like to. So since it's the first talk uh, about scars, I think it's good if I present uh, the, a bit of experiments that was performed in the group of Michel Lukin, 2017. And the idea of this experiment is that they have atoms, a chain of atoms that here are denoted by these uh, green dots arranged in a one-dimensional lattice. And this one-dimensional lattice is created by optical tweezers. So people can move them and change the distance that we almost at will. Okay. And the idea is that each atom is not in the ground state alone, otherwise they would just not interact and do nothing. So the atoms are driven by a two photon uh, transition to, and are coupled to a river state. And you can see the ladder structure here on the right okay, through an intermediate state, which is essentially not completed. And one can simplify the river space locally with just two states, uh, zero and one. Zero is the absence of, so zero is the absence of excitation, so the atom in the ground state, and one is the atom in the river state. And within the regime that we are experimentally this, uh, realized, the Hamiltonian that, um, that describes the dynamics up to intermediate time scale is the one which is depicted here. So it contains several terms. The first part is the single atom Hamiltonian, which contains a rabbi frequency omega and a term sigma x. This omega is the two photo rabbi frequency. And then an effective detuning small delta. Sorry for the type. Actually, this should be capital delta and j. And then on the top of that, if the two atoms are both in the river state, they interact rather strongly. Okay, uh, the interaction there can be several megahertz at distances of micrometers, and this interaction is typically depicted with just a potential, which most in most cases decays, like uh, at uh, long distances with a van der Waals profile, one over two to the six. So this model actually was introduced for completely different reasons, as far as I know, uh, in two thousand four by Fendlis and Guter Sasha, sometimes called FSS model, and was also discussed in connection to, to Rydberg atoms by Igor and Kolok co-works in 2012. Okay, and there is one particular aspect that is important for what we say today is that there is a phenomenon which is called Rydberg blockade, which is nothing but the following, that if you have, if you make these tweezers close enough, whenever you have an atom except in the Rydberg state, the interaction to other Rydberg state is so strong that actually you can't excite them at nearest neighbors. Okay? So the idea is that you can work directly in, a, you, you are effectively realizing a constrained Hilbert space where the product of two n operators and neighboring sites is, is exactly equal to zero. This phenomenon is called Rydberg blockade. Okay? So this is exactly the key feature that led to these observations. I mean, this is what was observed in the experiments. Here, what you have is a plot of the Rydberg probability density as a function of time. And essentially, you have to start looking at it after 2.2 microseconds, more or less, where I'm pointing my mouse here. And after this, there is a crunch with this uh, Hamiltonian that I described you before. Uh, and you can see that in this, in this crunch, there are features. Okay, there are these density wave states, that uh, black, yellow, black, yellow, that repeats itself okay, several times. Uh, but you can also notice another aspect is that in within this repetition, there is the opposite charge that appears. Okay? So there is this kind of uh, very strong and very anomalous uh, slow uh, decay of these density wave states. And, and this, I, I think, Zlatko was the first person to point out. I mean, this is really uh, related to the to the presence in the spectrum of these models of states which do not violate. Uh, do, do, do violate uh, that internalization hypothesis. And there has been a flurry of activity uh, discussing this in the context of stuff. models. I will not be able to review that. Okay? I think there are many people in the audience that are experts and have contributed to this rich field. Okay? So now the question is, how is this related to gauge theory at all? Well, the first thing, when you see this plot, even th without thinking about gauge theory, you think about plasma oscillations. Okay, so what are plasma oscillations? They're just anomalous visible oscillations of a system which is many body, because QED is many body, and where the decay of this oscillation does not happen over time scale which are corresponding to the microscopic couplings. 
Now, we know this from semi-classics, <clears throat> but this can also be established more quantum mechanically. And this is just a picture taken from a paper by, again, by Jürgen, a co-worker, Vanity Kasper. Uh, and here you find the evolution of QED in one plus one dimension, the evolution of the electric field as a function of time. You see this oscillation. And this, what this oscillation means in plasma, I'm thinking about what plasma oscillation is, displacement of a charge. Okay, essentially what happens is that you have huge many body oscillation between states which have charges at different positions in space. Okay. So the idea is that already without having to, to look at all the models, there is a very simple physical insight on why this slow dynamics could have a relation to, to particle physics. Okay. Of course, this can be done exactly, and I will not bore you with the with details also because we are running out of time. So the idea is that from the quantum leak model Hilbert space that I showed before, it is possible to map it one to one to this Rigbert chain. And the idea is, by, as depicted in this simple figure, if you look at the Hilbert space of the Rydberg, essentially, let us look at the odd even bonds, which are very simpler. Whenever you have a Rydberg atom on the left, it's a blue uh, link on the right. And then whenever you have a, a Rydberg atom on the, on the right, I put it as a red side here. And you can see that the transfer matrix is exactly the one of the quantum link. So if I have a Rydberg, I have blue here and blue here, because blue on the next side is the absence of, of an excitation. If I have instead no excitation, so red, I can have either an excitation or nothing afterwards. And you can reverse that and get the same on the, and get the opposite on the even of one. So the mapping is, is very simple. And then mapping also translates at the many body level. You can take these cartoon states, which are the density waves that, that we know from the experiment, and also the state with no excitation. And you can map it to the gauge theory. And it, it turns out that the two density, which are density we are nothing but string states. What does a string state mean? It means that the value of the electric field is constant, is perfectly flat. Okay? And there is no particle content either on the left or on the right. While instead the state in the middle is nothing but the proliferation of charges and anti, uh, anti-charges everywhere. Okay, where the gauge fields instead fluctuates like crazy. So we have now the simple interpretation of this net states and of the vacuum. Now Next step, you can do the mapping at the level of Hamiltonian. You can take the Schwinger model that I showed you before, and then to map it, map it to the peak speed, and you, you realize that the, the model that you get out is not exactly the peak speed. The peak speed is the first two terms, which are the kinetic energy, the minimal coupling, and the mass term of the fermions. There is an additional term here, which is a delta minus one to the J sigma z. This is not, was not there in the first experiments, and you can interpret this term as the as the one that comes out of this strange electric field square in the quantum link. And notice that the coefficient delta is theta minus pi theta was this topological angle. So this implies that when this theta, this capital delta is equal to zero, uh, the, the topological angle of the Schwinger model that is realized in the lab is exactly equal to pi. Okay? Uh, so this was for us uh, relatively exciting because it implies that gauge theories, which are typically very hard to realize in experiments, instead in this fixed model, they are realized at very large scales. Uh, now, can we learn something about this slow dynamics with this gauge theory? Now? Well, I mean, the idea is that we can, since we have a gauge theory, we can easily do quantum field theory on top of that. And the Schinger model, the quantum field theory that the Schinger model is very well known. This was due to Sidney Coleman. And you can see the picture here, phi and pi, they're two conjugate bosonic fields in the continuum. So this is something which is not very dissimilar from a Lattice liquid. Plus you have term, you have a term which is a, which is a first term, well, a mass, and also a cosine term, which is similar to a sine Gordon. Now this theory, exactly for t equal to pi, the value realized in the experiment, is integrable in a vanishing mass limit. Okay? And the continuum, we are talking about continuum. And we can already think about what happens in a material like that. If you, if you engineer a mass, uh, uh, this is the uh, V of phi is the effective potential. I mean, if you engineer a state in, the, in, a mini, in one of the minima of this potential, you let it evolve with a mass equal to zero. This will oscillate forever okay? and a continuum. Now, we can try to take this picture and apply it to the lattice model. Okay? One of these two minima, what is that? It's the string state, okay? because it's the mass is the is one of the minima when you have infinite mass or very large mass, so you, you don't want any fermion or uh, any positron or electron, so the only state possible are the string states. You quench it and you have oscillation between the string states. And that's exactly what is seen in the experiment. Okay, you have this continuous oscillation of string and anti-string states. 
uh, and this corresponds to, to, to the dynamics that we've seen. And let me also mention, this is not a feature of, uh, of the new quantum link. I mean, the, this can also be observed in multigs, abelian gauge theories, and Kuba three generic features of gauge theories. Okay? So this low dynamics in our language correspond to something which is called string inversion. Okay? So slightly uh, cooked up version of string breaking. Now, what are the ingredients, the key ingredients to see that? I mean, the underlying field theory has to be integral, but this has to be a low energy. Notice that whenever you tell low energy, you think about, okay, how can a low energy be ever influence what is going on here, which is clearly high energy. Well, the reality is that when you talk about quantum field theory, what is most important, I mean, the low energy is only the RG way we intend that. But if you have states which have smooth description, so the, where the, the, the field configuration is almost continuous, quantum field theory can also apply, even if you are not in the low energy part of the spectrum. So this is a, another requirement, this smooth the description. And you tell you again, I mean, this is a tar chart density way. If the field configuration is changing at the lattice spacing level, how can this state be well described by quantum field theory? Well, the reality is that when you, when you reformulate it in terms of this, um, Simple quantum field theory, this is a perfect state for the quantum field theory because the electric field value is constant. So you cannot imagine a better state to be described by, by field theory description. Okay? And uh, out of this lecture, can we learn something more like how to tune the strong oscillation or can we find slow dynamics in other models? Well, the idea is that one can do that. For instance, one can play a bit with this mass term. And we know that the mass term breaks integrability in the continuum. And the mass term, of course, makes the um, oscillation uh, damp down because it's breaking this effective uh, continuum integrability. So the picture that I drew you before does not apply anymore. Uh, and one can also see that in relation to critical points that were that were calculated that we calculated in the past without knowing at all that this was related to PXP models. Uh, it was just calculation uh, on on the um, on quantum electrodynamics. Okay? And the other thing that I think is interesting is that you can immediately generalize this mechanism. Okay. Uh, you, for instance, you can take the, the Wilsonian version of the Schwinger model without any constraint on the speed. This is an infinite dimensional field theory. Okay? You can do that, do the numerics, and you will see this very slow decay in oscillations. Okay? In, in the, actually, in very similar parameter as you would respect to the one that you had in the PXP. But you can also take different theories. For instance, you can take Young Mills. Okay? Young Mills can also have an integrable effective field theory, can also have states with uh, smooth descriptions, you go and do the same type of plot that Zlatko introduced, like plotting the entropy as a function of energy, and you see bands of states which do not belong to the ETH band. Okay? Now, yet this is not as easy as U1. Of course, we cannot do large system sizes. Also, the physical interpretation is more complicated, but it's all fitting within the same kind of a field theoretical toolbox. And then you can also think about how to extend this type of, of uh, of behavior to more than two dimensions. The problem is that if you go to more than one dimension, um, the concept of integrability in the continuum is kind of lost because there is a theory which is called Coleman Mandula that tells you that you don't have integrable non trivial field theory uh, in, in more than one dimension. The way to fight this is to introduce supersymmetry because supersymmetry evades the Coleman Mandula. And in, indeed, if you, there are supersymmetric lattice models that we have shown have. Uh, quantum scars, even though they don't have really bands, they have more isolated states. Okay, I think I'm, I'm essentially very much over time. So this was a quick discussion on, on, on how we do that. If the Schwinger model is unconstrained, this is type of oscillation. We can do also a bit of analytics here, but let me skip that. Uh, and I think that, that's the, the slide I will probably end my presentation on. I mean, we have learned that there are out of this story, we have learned that there are many different phenomena here. There is this beautiful river experiments with the explanation of, of quantum scars from one side. But there is, a, there is a lot of things which are related to that, like plasma oscillations, okay? simple plasma oscillation that can be studied in high intensity laser facility. This is the example that I was mentioned before. Of course, this plasma oscillation also happened in gluon matter. This is another simulation done, done in the other group for the same type of physical phenomena. And there are quantum links. So I think the most main message of the talk is that all of these apparently unrelated phenomena related to different models, different physical settings, and so on and so forth, live under the same umbrella. Okay, so this concept of weaker easy breaking is not really related and confined on to this liberal span, but can expand to actually naturally expand to very different fields. Okay, I think I'm already out of time, so I will skip the MBL part. 
Uh, let me jump directly to the, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but if you have questions, I'm of course happy to discuss. Uh, so let me thank again my collaborators, Federica, Paolo, Giuliano, Alessia, Andrea, uh, Marlon, Marcus, and Antonella. I, would, I would, didn't have time to talk about uh, their work. And these are some references, and I thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I mean, uh, no worries. I mean, we can we can go into the second part in questions now. Um, Sergey, uh, I see your hand. Would you like Would you like to ask a question? I was actually just a hand clapping, not a raised hand. Oh, okay, Sorry. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, maybe I can start with. Oh, okay, Peter. Uh, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you for a very nice talk. Can you tell a couple of words about the MBA part? Uh, yes, of course. Huh? Let's say I will do that. A couple of words is a bit challenging, but I can try to, to give an idea of, of what it is. So, so maybe shall we actually collect the other question and then I devote maybe five minutes to this at the end? Uh, Zlatko, how do you want to arrange that? Yeah, maybe maybe if there are some questions about the first part, we go through that. Can I ask a question? Unfortunately, since I'm a co-host, I cannot raise my hand, but so if I can ask, I mean, I remember that um, after the PXP paper uh, came out, uh, essentially uh, Zlatko group realized that this, let's say, these oscillations in the PXP are not, uh, let's say, perfect, and they can be improved by adding additional terms in the Hamiltonian such that the oscillations become more, let's say, I mean, endure more in time. Do you understand that terms from the gauge theory viewpoint? The first term, yes. The, the second, no. I can tell you why. So in gauge theories, there is a mechanism to make a, a field theory on the left is more and more uh, in agreement with the quantum field theory. This, this theoretical framework is called improved action. Okay? Maybe some of you know it. In the, it's also used in the context of easy models, actually. So it's not something that is only for, for quantum field theory, but that's very well known. Essentially, what you do, you add counter terms to your Hamiltonian, and this counter terms makes this quantum field theory better. Better, so in, the that, better uh, in the sense that it better best describes the quantum field theory limit, the five beam and finite lattice spacing. Okay, okay, got it. Giuliano did the first calculation. I mean, this is very challenging, okay? It's not cheap things. Giuliano did the first calculation of this uh, improved action, it's called improved action, and he mentioned exactly the paper by Slatko Dima in 2019. Mm -hmm. The first correction is exactly the same. However, the second, calculating the second correction, uh, since it's a, it's a perfect action conform field theory, the type of operator that appear in next reading order are less, much less trivial. And uh, we were, I, honestly, I don't know enough to comment on the difficulty. Giuliano told me that it was very hard. But so, so we might say that, that the perfect revivals arise when- Yeah, if you have a perfect action, if you have a perfect theory. Yeah, when if you go to the quantum field theory, there's the plasma oscillation in the integral they are not that. Right? Okay, got it. Got so, it. I also, if I remember correctly, it's like to, I mean, the profile of the, of the uh, term that you were adding was exponentially decaying as a function of distance and operator content, which very much suggests like a, an operator of OPE expansion. Right? But see. we were not able to prove it, so I think I should shut up. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers. Uh, yeah, Zala, please go ahead. Hi, Marcello. So I'd like to understand, so you're saying the, that the underlying integrable field theory is crucial, right, for your uh, non-thermalizing behavior, while in the scarce models, it's more about this emergent kind of spectrum generating algebra. So how do I bring those two now together? Is it this kind of spectrum? Spectrum generating algebra is also in your theories, but it has additional structure as well, which makes it also integrable. That's an excellent question. I don't have an answer. Uh, this was actually one of the things I wanted to discuss in the outlook. Relation to, uh, to the figure interpretation with the, this, this is a, a spectral symmetries, and I don't have a clear way on how to connect them. I'm sorry. As of course, an excellent uh, point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sergey. 
Hi. So, uh, Hi. Marcel, can you can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I wanted to ask the question a question about the the mapping. So you're saying that this gauge th theory, the Schwinger model at the angle theta equal to pi, is the same as this PXP model, right? So this yes. is uh, the statement. Yes. Uh, yeah, my question is about so so this makes sense to me if if you know if the chain is closed and you know you have a zero charge by the Gauss law and so it's a purely bosonic model. So my question is like if you have boundaries, so like it seems to me that you can have some fermions attached to this boundary. So so could you did you did you look into like the mapping in, in presence of boundaries, so uh, like uh, yes, I mean, if the, if you have boundaries, you can, there can be additional effects. However, even with boundaries, if you work in the vacuum, so a charge neutrality, there are no boundary effects. So if you move outside of the vacuum sector, what you said can happen, but this was not something we investigated in detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. In that sector, let me mention this scarring is likely not to occur because there, in the when you do the quantum field theory mapping, you have an additional chemical potential that also breaks integrability in the continuum very strongly. It is no this fact is known I and mean, for not not by us, somebody has shown that. So, but of course, one can try to do this mapping there. Mm -hmm. So, but from from that perspective. Uh, uh, how to say so? On a finite chain, these two systems are not completely equivalent, right? Somehow, one would say that PX. No, no, they are equivalent in the vacuum sector. No, no, in the vacuum sector, they, they will have the same spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you move away from the vacuum sector, they are not exactly equivalent. Two spectra have a difference. Right, right. Understood. Okay, thanks. Cheers. Would you like to comment on the mapping in uh, higher dimensions? Okay, so the mapping in higher so, so, uh, the mapping in higher dimension it's very different, of course. Actually, okay, let me say like this. Uh, it does not actually. I mean, when you take a gauge theory and you map it, you you integrate out the matter field, you always get a, an effective model, but the effective model is very complicated. Because the first the inverse space is not tensile, so you will have PXP type effect also in more than one D, but they can also be non-local, this well, finite range, these constraints. And um, we had a look at, uh, at the mapping, not of the not of quantum mechanics, but another model in 2D. And uh, but uh, the point is there, and this mapping they lead to, to very complicated interactions. So I'm not so sure one can learn a lot. I mean, the reason why we look at these mappings in 2D was mostly from a quantum simulation viewpoint, not from the quantum scaling. I mean, as I, as I was mentioning, I think the only thing that we can learn in moving more than one from what we said is that if you use supersymmetry, it's much easier to get scaling. Okay, but uh, I don't think we can learn more than this statement because of course, my mandula that blocks all the other conclusions. In more than one day. So, if you wish, I can Any say two words. Oh, oh, okay. I can say two words about this NBN. Yeah, yeah, we'll, oh, okay. we'll come to that if there are no other questions about scars. Uh, Jie Dong, you have a question about scars? Yes. Uh, yeah, in this uh, Pauli spin Hamiltonian, you have the stable magnetic field. You, with the amplitude denoted by this delta, okay? Uh, this uh, stable field is essential for this scar? No, no, this, uh, this delta is actually something that will kill the scar, okay? So, uh, and it is nice to understand because if we, if we write down the field theory for this capital delta, uh, so uh, including this capital delta, sorry for that, this capital delta, what it does, it, it introduces additional contributions to this second gen element here. Okay? So it makes the theory immediately not integrable in the continuum. And actually, we did numerical experiments to show this. I mean, it's a bit 
when you, when you want the lattice, large delta that it breaks the scar is kind of trivial. But that is small and it breaks the scar is a bit less trivial. And we did numerics and we saw that this small, that this, uh, this capital F indeed, I mean, uh, decreases the amplitude of the oscillations very rapidly. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, I don't see any other questions about this. So maybe we can go to the really slow dynamics now. Okay, so the, the, really, the really slow one, I mean, I, I was, well, let me see, okay. Uh, so the reason why we look at this MBL with this order, or, or actually the absolute disorder, but with fake disorder, is because it is known that if you look at the effect of Coulomb law, so which in one dimension is an interaction which increases the function of distance, this is already known to, to lead to very slow dynamics. It's not leading to any algorithmic breaking, but it's, very, it's already an interesting ingredient. And we just asked the question whether this alone um, can, can be enough to lead some kind of ergodicity breaking in some extreme cases, not like just a trivial parametric slowdown of thermodynamics. Uh, and the idea is that we did the quenches with the sugar model, not in this quantum link, but in the Wilson formulation. And we did something very trivial. Instead of, we put the thermionic field in a nail state. This, uh, you can see it in this gray, red, gray, red. And then we put the gauge field just in an arbitrary superposition of three states, plus, minus one, and zero. Okay. And if you let this state evolve, both Hamiltonian and state, uh, state are absolutely translation invariant. Yeah? So here there is no disorder in anything. But if you do quantum quenches and then, for instance, measure something which is called current condensate fraction, you can understand this as just a staggered magnetization. This is this uh, current condensate fraction as a function of time for, for 26 spin, 26 sides, and for different values of the uh, electromagnetic coupling, j is equal to j squared divided by 2. And you can see here that for more small interaction, this essentially goes to zero. While if you increase the interaction, this goes, grows larger. Okay, and uh, sorry. And here, just to have an idea, that's the infinite temperature expectation. This is zero. So this implies that there are very strong memory effects. And if you perform a finite size scaling analysis of these memory effects by looking at the height of this plateau as a function of system size, where if the coupling is small, you see that this goes to zero. So there, there is no memory. While if there is the coupling is large, over to one, you see there is a very strong memory effect. Okay, it's so actually the coupling in the in the after finite size scaling, the, the expectation value of this operator is large. Sorry, can you clarify what model we are looking at now? So this is now the Schwinger model in the Wilson formulation. So instead of having the spins plus and one half, minus one half, we really put a parallel transporter there. Now we can still do numerics because we utilize Gauss law to simplify the, the, the nature of the inverse space. But the inverse space dimension is infinite, technically speaking. Um, and so this is a, another plot which discusses the entanglement entropy of a parti half partition of the system as a function of time. And one can see two different regimes. I mean, the first one is when J is small, again, J equals 0.1, this violet data points. And here, the entropy essentially increases linear with time and saturates to the thermal value relatively quickly, a time scale of order 10. Instead, if you put a very strong J, well, internet strong J, J over the one, this entropy grows very slowly and it doesn't even fit with a log. Okay, that's the, the green line here is a log. Uh, and what Marcus did, um, he did do math with a relatively high precision arithmetics because one has to go to really long times and then plot that against a double log scale. And you can see it here. And you see that this fits relatively nicely with a double log behavior, which Im implies that this universality class of dynamics is definitely not uh, something which is related to, to simple presence of integral of motions. Probably integral motion plus some interactions, even though it's not clear if Coulomb interaction are, uh, on top of integral motion will lead to that. We have only found one system where this is seen, uh, this double log. It's actually an interactive system, so it should be unrelated to what we are talking about. Okay. So we, we do not have this explanation, but we know that this has to be somehow different universality class. And also, we checked that the entropy is, was uh, not extensive, and this was just a simple check. So that, that's, that's a very short summary, three minutes and 40 seconds of this MBL part. I'm sorry for that, but uh, it, I mean, I'm happy to stay longer for discussion if people are interested. Okay, do we have any questions about this? 
So this uh, this model has a fragmented Hilbert space, right? Are you looking at the uh, a large fragment or everything or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me say that I think fragmented and gauge it's a bit different thing. I mean, this model has super selection sector, like every gauge, every gauge theory. Okay. So what we're looking at are the dynamics of states, which have components in the different super selection sectors. Okay. So in this language of fragmentation, we'll be looking at states which have components everywhere. Of course, the different components evolve independently. They cannot touch each other because they are, they are, they are separated by symmetry elements. But if you will do an experiment, you will just observe the collective effect. Um, I don't see any other questions. Peter, did that? I hope that answered your. Um... Yes, Peter, thank you very well. well. Thank you, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Marcello? Okay, well, we are more or less on time. So I suggest that we stop the recording now and take a 10 minute break, but. Uh, if anybody would like to continue talking informally with Marcello, they can still do that in the channel. Um, and we'll start the next talk in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs>